I'm David Siegel. I'm the founder of Mad Radish, and I'm ready to start digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. This is the latest in our series of one-on-one conversations with thoughtful, interesting, accomplished people in many different fields. We've talked to astronauts, Olympic champions, musicians, entrepreneurs, TV hosts, and more. We explore their stories, their challenges, their defining moments, and we learn from them. We learn the powerful lessons that we can apply to our own lives. And here's how we do it. We start off with some fun, rapid-fire questions that reveal little pieces of information about the guest, and then we start digging deep into those stories and life lessons. Our guest today is David Siegel. Many of you will know David as the highly successful entrepreneur who launched David's Tea in 2008. David's Tea took a product that was 5,000 years old and completely overhauled it and innovated and grew from a single store to a retail giant worth $200 million. Forbes named David's Tea as one of the 25 most innovative retail brands in the world. And in 2017, David was named one of Canada's 40 Under 40. David has since launched Mad Radish, a restaurant that provides gourmet fast foods. I've been there many times myself. And as you will hear, he has recently expanded the business to offer two additional brands. And they're all available on multiple digital platforms as part of a new business strategy that we're going to hear about. In our discussion... We talk about how David was drawn to entrepreneurship from a young age, how he measures risk, the difference between a good idea and a good business, the critical distinction between nice to have and need to have, why interesting is a bad word in business, why failure is a part of entrepreneurship, the fundamentals of scaling a business, reinvention, the freedom that comes from not having to prove yourself. We talk about the idea of working on yourself first, about making your company as much about the employees as anything else, why the biggest hurdle is people and not money, and he'll share the story of how he ended up calling his business David's Tea, even though he didn't originally like that name. We also talk about something he calls business purgatory, which I found particularly fascinating and insightful. Now, one last thing before we get started. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to Digging Deep and post a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, and also share this with your network. And if you're looking for more information about this episode of the show, including links to anything we reference in our discussion, if you want to read my daily blog, where I post every single day of the year, or if you want to subscribe to my newsletter, The Weekly Dig, which has five very quick items I've learned about each week, you can find all of that, including the show notes, at our website, which is letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. You can also find a link there to my TEDx talk. Now, let's start digging deep with David Siegel. David, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to Digging Deep. I have followed your career and always been very impressed by what you've done and and how young you did it. We'll talk about that coming up. And also, I am a regular customer at Mad Radish and love the food there and love what you've done with that. So it's really exciting to have the chance to talk to you today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Let's jump into some questions here. Let's uh, go back to your childhood. And what would you say was your fondest childhood memory? Um, I'd probably say fishing with my dad. Okay. Uh, he's a pretty avid fisherman and we would go, uh, on, on these, uh, pretty hardcore trips, um, that were very difficult as a child, but as an adult, I, I appreciate anywhere in particular, we go to Pulaski, New York, which is upstate New York for the salmon run, uh, Malone, uh, for trout fishing, which is also New York state, uh, or, or sometimes just out on our, uh, I grew up on the Ottawa river. So sometimes just out on the Ottawa river, um, fishing, you know, for bass. Sounds great. Who was your hero when you were 10 years old? 
I, I was, uh, um, I loved everything sports. Um, it, it, baseball was probably my first love, but basketball is, is became a, uh, a second and lasting love. Uh, so everybody from Michael Jordan to Joe Carter and Roberto Alomar from that famous Toronto Blue Jays team. Uh, but yeah, but I, as, a, as, a, as a young boy, uh, sports was everything for me. Okay. Me too. What did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Uh, I thought I knew I'd be either, uh, well, I knew I'd be in business. And, and to be honest, I, I knew I'd be an entrepreneur at a very young age. Yeah, and we'll come back to that because uh, yeah. I, I read that and I, I'm very interested to hear how you, how, what sparked your interest in that. So what is your life story in six words? <laughs> Resilience, determination, love, um, passion, optimism. Those are all good words. What is one of your greatest mistakes and what did you learn from it? I think that my, my biggest mistakes, well, rather than isolate one mistake, I would say that my biggest mistakes come from uh, not being able to fully understand my emotions in a given situation and letting those emotions govern my decision making. For what do you feel most grateful? My family my health, um, my kids, of course. What has been the best year of your life so far and why? I'd have to go with, you know, so many good years in the past, in the past decade or so, you know, getting, getting married to the love of my life, uh, the birth of each one of my three kids, um, my business, uh, David's Tea, which was my business prior to Mad Radish going public, starting Mad Radish, uh, and even this year, you know, being faced with, with adversity and, and having to find creative ways to try and overcome that and having to come together as a family to get through something difficult. Um, I view every year as, as an opportunity, even, even the ones that don't go so well. And what would you say has been the toughest year of your life so far? Um, I would say when I, the year that I sold uh, my stake in David's Tea, uh, and had to f figure out what the next chapter of my life was going to be. It was a very difficult year in my life, 2016. What one person has had the greatest impact on your life? My wife, Emily. What is the most important lesson you've learned that you would share with other people? Well, work on yourself first. Understand and work on yourself first. What would people be most surprised to learn about you? <laughs> Like a fun fact, eh? Uh, yeah. It's not that you don't drink tea because you're drinking tea right now. So I do drink tea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was never that a big be, coffee guy. That would be a big surprise. <laughs> um, surprise to learn about me. I don't know. I, I, I used to be into English literature. <laughs> okay. I ended, up, I ended up taking it as a minor at, uh, at McGill. What's your secret talent? My secret talent? Uh, I can jump pretty high for a white guy. <laughs> okay. You play basketball, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I'd call it that when you're pushing 40 now, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do. What's the most fun you've ever had? The most fun I've ever had. Um, oh, gee, that's a tough one. You know, I have fun every day. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, I love warm climates. So, so I'd have to go with a, a family vacation uh, to, to, the, to, to, to any tropical area. Okay. What is the scariest thing you've ever done? Um, starting and building businesses. What is your boldest prediction for the future? That it will likely have more similarities to the past than people realize. Very interesting. What would be the message of your commencement address? That, that attitude uh, is everything. What has been a recent epiphany for you, something you've discovered or something about which you've changed your mind? That I need to embrace the unknown. What book are you most likely to recommend to other people? Oh, I mean, there's so many good ones. I'm going to go with Shoe Dog. I just thought it was the greatest story I've, I've read in a long time. Can you give a quick synopsis? So it's, it's uh, Phil Knight's book, who's the founder of Nike. And it just tells the story of how Nike was built. And I think what's so interesting about it is 
you know, you think of these companies like Nike or, or Starbucks or any of these big, big multinational conglomerates as these overnight success stories. And I mean, Nike was a, a decades long overnight success story. I mean, it, it took him, you know, 10 years into Nike, he was still, he was still nowhere basically. Um, and, and it was almost by fluke that he ended up becoming the brand that he is today. I mean, he was essentially a distributor for a Japanese shoe company. Uh, and it was only because the Japanese shoe company kind of screwed him that he ended up uh, transitioning into Nike. And, and so, I mean, it's an interesting story faced with an incredible amount of adversity um, and starting and stopping, you know, two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. And, and I find the language and the way it's written just very compelling and it's just a great read. Okay. Interesting. David, thank you for answering those questions. We're going to take a quick break. And in a moment, we'll start digging deep with David Siegel. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them, too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore, and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high-level advice, and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions, but in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper, or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks.ca. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. David, once again, great to chat with you. And there's so much from your quick answers uh, that I want to explore. And obviously, lots of other stuff to talk about as well. But I want to go back to the origin of your entrepreneurship 
your interest in entrepreneurship. What do you think sparked that? Why did you picture that for yourself at a young age? Well, I just, I love this idea of creating something from nothing. Uh, it's always fascinated me. It's always compelled me um, to move towards it. Uh, and, and I've never been afraid to put myself out there uh, in, in, that, in that sense. Um, so I, I, I can't explain it. It's just something that as a, at a very, very young age, I mean, I had lots of people in my extended family. My father's a psychologist. My mom was an artist. But, but I had people in my extended family who were in business. And so I got that exposure, including my, my grandfather's. Um, and so I got that exposure at a young age, um, certainly. But I, I just always, I was one of, I mean, I had my, you know, I started, I was very precocious young kid. I, I wanted to work at a very young age. I started by delivering what was called back then the penny saver, which you had to, it would come in, in, you had to put flyers into the paper. So we would sit there and we put flyers in and, and then we'd go and deliver it to a hundred doors. And then I, I do between that and the occasional Ottawa citizen uh, paper route uh, delivery where I'd fill in for one of the regulars. I mean, that was my early job. And then I went on to work at Wendy's and athletes world, which was a shoe company back then that no longer exists. Um, and then I started my first business at 18 selling first aid kits in a partnership with St. John's ambulance uh, door to door, you know, I hired a team for the summer and we did that and just sort of grew from there. And I just, I just, you know, and I always, I always envisioned myself, um, being in a dynamic business or something just creating. Very interesting. Yeah. I had an Ottawa citizen paper route when I was a kid too. And it, it is like you're running a little business, right? Because course, you're collecting yeah. the revenue and you're, yep. you're a contractor effectively, you're a, you're a distributor for the, for the newspaper. Um, so, we're going to talk a lot about David's tea and how you built that. And of course, Mad Radish, but what is Fitting Room Central, which was one of the first Ooh. businesses you started? Tell us about that. So uh, I went to McGill and when I left, um, while most of my friends were getting jobs at uh, in, in Lehman Brothers at the time and, and uh, Bear Stearns and Goldman Sachs uh, and Procter Gamble, um, I, I didn't fit that mold. And so I, I, they didn't really want me, to be honest. Um, so I, I, I worked, uh, in, in different jobs. I ended up working for a traffic counting company. And what that is, is they, they count in retail at, at the time and still today, actually, they'll have these traffic counters at the door that count how many people are coming in. And the idea is to give you a conversion on the traffic coming in your stores versus how many you're converting into sales. Um, and then while I was at that company, I had this idea where I was like, Hey, you know, when you buy clothing, you actually buy it in two stages. First, you evaluate the look of the item on the rack, and then you evaluate the fit of the item on your body. So my idea was, hey, can we capture what items are going into the fitting room and then compare that to what's being bought? And so we can give retailers a further insights into why something's selling. See, retailers knew if something was selling, but they didn't really have a good handle as to why. So with this fitting room information, we could be able to tell them this item got tried on 100 times, but only bought twice. Versus this item got tried on 50 times and, only, and got bought 10 times. Well, the first item had a better visual appeal on the rack, but, but there was perhaps a fit issue and, and the reverse on the second item. So anyway, that, that was the main feature. And then, of course, we had feedback uh, um, built into the system that you could gather at the fitting room. Um, and, and yeah, and that was the idea. And, and then we went around and started, I mean, I pitched it to every I mean, I'd write these handwritten letters to every CEO of every major uh, clothing company you can think of, you know, Les Wexner from the limited and the gap and, and, and uh, you know, and I, got, and I was pretty good at getting these presentations. I mean, we'd go in and we'd present, you know, all across America to these different retailers. And we finally got a pilot at Macy's on 34th and 7th. So they agreed to put in the system. Uh, and, in New York and, City. In New York City, in Macy's 34th and 7th. So I was there working with their IT team, getting the system installed. Um, and in the end, it never went anywhere. And, and the reason it didn't go anywhere, and what I learned from that was we were a bit ahead of our time, number one. Two, it was a bit complex in order to implement systems back then, more so than it is today. Um, and the integration of those systems with POS uh, and within the, the broader management infrastructure was, was difficult. But primarily why it didn't work was that it was a nice to have, not a must have. 
And, and uh, I kept hearing this word while I would go and pitch it, which would be interesting. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? And you realized over time, you know, interesting is, is actually a bad word in business. The word you want to hear in business is when can you deliver? Um, interesting is a very academic term. Uh, and it, it kept me in what I like to call business purgatory for a while. Um, and, and, you know, once we got the pilot and we realized that they weren't going to roll this out and invest in it, uh, you know, in those days, they were, their POS was clunky. I mean, it wasn't great. This is before the cloud. Um, so, so systems were just simply not that, the basic systems were simply not that advanced. And the, the notion of having this additional data that you had to then do something with to make it, to, to get an ROI from it, um, it, just, it just never caught on. And so eventually I had to, I had to, to say enough and move on and, and, and admit to failure and lick my wounds and go do something else. Yeah, I think that's a really valuable insight that a failure isn't always a terrible idea. It can just be an okay idea, right? Yeah, I mean, it has to be a good business. A lot of people get hung up on whether something is a good idea or not. Um, but the question is not whether it's a good idea. Is it a good business? Are the economics of the business good? Um, what are the peculiarities of the business that make it a defensible position that has a strong value proposition or not? Uh, good ideas often make bad businesses. Can you think of some examples of that? Well, I mean, this was a great example. I mean, the, the, fitting room, the fitting room system I built would have been a great add-on feature for an established POS company. You know, but it's not a, it, it wasn't good enough right. to be a standalone business on its own. Well, even just what you said there is interesting because I think a lot of people have ideas for products and then they, you know, they, they go out into the world and they're making one product and there's all the other companies in that space are making hundreds of products and they're giants and they have the relationships with whatever it is they need, you know, the retailers or, or whoever. Yeah. And you're making this one product. So you might be a great product, might be a great idea, but you're not set up to be the person to put it out there. It, right? It's a little bit different today in that the cost of distribution has gone down dramatically thanks to companies like Shopify and Amazon and all these other e-commerce players. So when you're talking about product business, certainly you could get into more finer niches than you would have been able to in the past. E-commerce has really enabled that. But, but yeah, I mean, you, you do have to ask yourself when you come, I mean, I had a guy call me in, in the T-space wanting me to invest in a company that was selling this special kind of chicory root tea and chicory root is, is a, it's a root that produces it almost, it, it looks like coffee and has this very rich flavor to it, uh, but it doesn't have caffeine. And so they were going to sell this as an alternative to coffee. Um, and, and I had experience selling chicory root at David's tea, knowing it is not, was, had not yet become a mainstream thing. And, and I just felt, you know, I, I said to them, listen, I think you guys are going after too small of a niche. Um, so there are, there are, you know, you have to ask yourself, is your product, but you know, for every example like that, you know, somebody will point out coconut water and, and how that, that really took off. Right. So, I mean, it's a difficult assessment to make whether you're, uh, uh, going after trying to build a business off of a one skew business, or you're actually uncovering a new trend. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but certainly it's a question you want to ask yourself. But is there a risk you can get too attached to a good idea that's not a good business? Absolutely. I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't know when to, when to admit to failure and move on. Um, it's part of what makes entrepreneurs great entrepreneurs, frankly, is the resilience. But, but sometimes that can work against you. Yeah. And did you, was it a tough decision for you or were you, do you, think you were able to? to Very. I, I probably went on about a year longer than I should have with that. Right. Uh, I think I, in total, I spent about three years on it. Uh, and I probably are two and a half or something like that. And I probably should have spent two. Yeah. But that's, you know, there are people who spend five years or 10 years too long on something. Oh, there are people or, who spend a lifetime on it. Yeah. I mean, you, you see these entrepreneurs that have just been banging away the same thing that hasn't worked and they just don't have it in them to admit it didn't work. Yeah. But there's no, there's no harm in fail. I mean, that uh, failure is part of entrepreneurship. I mean, if you, if you think you're going to bat a, a, a thousand, forget it. Um, you, you have to be ready to fail. And, and, and that's, that's part of the game. I mean, most, most don't succeed. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's the reality. And, and if you really want to go for it, you have to go in knowing and accepting that as, as, as something that is just part of it. Yeah. 
So let's turn to David's tea and and how you got that started and and why you decided to innovate in that space. A lot of people have pointed out it was, you know, this is a long established product category, thousands of years by the time you came along. How was it that you were able to do something different in that space? Well, I think it was it was the perfect storm. I mean, I was uh, so I had, I had this fitting room idea had not worked. Uh, and I needed a job and I had a terrible resume at this point. I mean, I, I, you know, I hadn't had a quote unquote real job. Um, and, and, uh, my wife who was my girlfriend at the time looked at me, he's like, you need a real job enough already. Um, she was getting frustrated with me. I, I mean, I wasn't bringing any real income. And so I, I, uh, I approached a, a, a cousin of mine, my dad's cousin, who I had gotten to know while I, while I was at McGill in Montreal. Um, who is the founder of Le Chateau. Uh, he's 50 years my senior. Um, so he's, he's actually turning 90. And, and um, at the time, he was in his 70s. And, and um, I, I, you know, he, he was kind enough to give me a job. He, at the time, was taking a step back from Le Chateau and looking for companies to invest in. And he said, look, you'll help me look at these companies. Uh, he's like, you've now had this business failure under your belt. So at the very least, you know what not to do. Um, and, and, you know, you, you'll help, help me, help me do due diligence basically as a small private equity group. And so I figured, great, I'm going into private equity. So, you know, you, you, what are the first thing I did? I bought a book. I bought Warren Buffett's book on what he looks for in investments. Um, and it was kind of the perfect storm. I, I was in Montreal at this tea house that is off the beaten path, uh, off of St. Denis, those of you who know Montreal, um, across from this international movie theater. And, um, my wife had gotten tickets to, uh, through her work to this movie at the Montreal Film Festival, and we were waiting to go see it. Uh, and, and we're like, oh, well, let's go into this tea house and check it out. And everything just kind of came together for me in there. I sort of thought to myself, geez, nobody's doing this uh, uh, in a fun way on the main streets of the country. Um, there's all kinds of different permutations and combinations. You know, something I realized later on, I mean, tea is, is like anything you put in hot and cold water. It's not coffee, even though it's a very specific plant. It's the Camellia sinensis plant and how you process it makes it different. But in North America, we don't, we don't talk, we don't use the term that way. We use it to imply any herb or fruit or anything that's infused in water that's, that's not coffee. Um, so there's endless, it's like cooking and the creativity is endless, right? You can, you can do all these different combinations. Um, and then, and then concurrent with the book I was reading, Warren Buffett's book on what he's looking for, it happens to be a Warren Buffett business as well. I mean, it's high margin, um, not a lot of skews. So skew is a stock keeping unit. And in, in the clothing business, it, it basically allows you to keep track of your stock. And so it's, it's, you have the item level, then you have the, the color, then you have the size. So for, for the, any shirt that you might be wearing, you might have, I, I mean, you know, you might have three or four colors and then four or five sizes in each color. So it's a lot of management. In T, you don't have that. You have, you have the T, right? And then you sell it by weight. So much, much less uh, inventory to track. You can operate out of very small spaces. It's not like a, uh, you're selling television sets. So you can get smaller spaces that do high volume per square foot, which is very efficient in retail. It ships really well for e-commerce. Uh, and even in 2007, we were, I was thinking about that. Um, and, and, um, and, and it doesn't spoil like, like a turkey sandwich. Um, so it's, it's got some really nice characteristics that make it not just a good idea, but a great business. Um, and a great business that produces uh, uh, cash can help absorb your mistakes that you're inevitably going to make as you're developing it. Um, and so we were one of the early pioneers of tea and, and I went into the work the next day and I told my cousin, I said, uh, tea, we should do tea. And he kind of said, huh, tea. And anyway, long story short, we went to look for a few to invest in. Cause remember I'm a private equity, uh, um, worker at this time. And, and really there weren't any, any time I went in, I had a million and one ways I wanted to make it better. So finally I turned to my cousin. I said, look, I'll do it. You back me. And away we went, um, we, we, uh, uh, we did it together and it was a great combination of youth and experience and, and he, he backed it. I was, I was the sweat, he was the equity and, um, you know, and, and together we started opening tea stores and we built a really amazing team that, that put together an incredible marketing, uh, look and feel that was young and youthful and was able to turn what people had perceived as your grandmother's cup of tea into something that was fresh. 
Um, and it just started to take on a life of its own uh, once we launched. How were you able to scale it? Because a, a lot of people uh, open a store with the idea of, oh, you know, we're going to be all over North America. We're going to have 100, 200, 300 stores, but very few people are able to do that. So what made the difference right. in your case? So the biggest, the biggest, uh, well, a couple of things. One, the, the, the economics of the business were strong. So even they only got stronger as time went on, but, but, you know, we would double sales, let's say in a store over a three, four year period, but even still in year one, the sales were, were the bit, the economics were so good that the business, it worked. Like you still were producing positive cash flow to the stores. Uh, that's number one. That's really important. A lot of businesses take a few years to get strong economically. Um, this wasn't one of them. It was good from day one on these new stores. Um, the second thing, and, and of course, every new store we opened, we got more e-commerce sales because the, the stores act as like a discovery center and the e-commerce becomes one of the distribution points. Uh, but the biggest hurdle to being able to expand your business, and I think a lot of people make this mistake, is, is generally not money. The financing tends to come if the, if the business is a good business. Um, it's usually people. And, and it's being able to get quality people to work with you and, and run it with you. Uh, and you need to be able to build a, a, a company culture that is a meritocracy that rewards uh, um, hard work and, and results. And, and, um, uh, and, and you have to make people feel like they're part of something special, which they were. I mean, we were really doing something that was so new at, at the time. Uh, you know, it seems obvious today, but, you know, we'd have customers come in the store They'd, they'd smell like vanilla in the tea and their mind would get blown and they run out of the store after buying some and bring in another friend and look at the, the tea guide, which is what we called our salespeople behind the cash and be like, do the thing. And you're like, what do you mean? And you go, do the thing you just did for me. And, and, and of course, you take down the vanilla tea tin again and the, the friend would smell it and go, oh my God, that's incredible. Um, you know, and, and it was just, it, it, it sort of caught on and it was this hot thing that people wanted to be a part of. Um, so, so, and, and we scaled it fairly aggressively. Uh, we took a big gamble. I mean, we were at, we went from one store to two stores, then to nine stores. And then in one year, we went from nine stores to 40 stores overnight, overnight in one year. Yeah. Uh, it was wow. the craziest year of my life. Um, we made all kinds of mistakes, but like I was saying to you, when the economics of the business are strong, you can absorb your mistakes. And we were able to do that. And, and, you know, we just got better and better at it once we got a little bit of scale. What did you learn from that going from nine to 40 stores in one year? Because that is incredibly fast. Well, and I think that works really well when you're, when you're, I mean, we weren't the first to do tea in this way, but we certainly were one of the first. And I think that when you're in a, uh, an arms race, you have to ask yourself whether the business you're in is an arms race where you're at, in the start of a business in its infancy and, and speed is of the essence, or when building in processes and systems and taking it a bit slower because there isn't a huge advantage in putting your flag down first uh, is going to be the, the 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 better way to approach it, and I think with tea it was a little bit different. I mean, Mad Radish is a little bit different in that regard. Mad Radish, we want to make sure that we've really nailed down our food program. Uh, um, you know, Mad Radish, we're all about gourmet fast foods, and we've recently added two new brands brands into our store: uh, Louise's Burritos and Bowls and Revival Pizza. And we're now working really hard to perfect those brands along with the Mad Radish brand perfect our processes, our systems before we begin to scale because food is, is a much more difficult product to execute than tea. Uh, you know, the salesperson in a tea store can really only screw up the service. Um, but in a, in a restaurant, the salesperson can screw up the service, the product and your margin in one fell swoop. Mm. So it's, it's a very different business in that regard. In the, in the case of tea, I think speed was of the essence. Nobody had gone to Winnipeg or Saskatoon or Calgary or Edmonton with this type of tea store. So getting there first really be, makes you the brand of choice. And um, so we, we I, don't, I don't know that we did that consciously, but that was the approach. It was going well. So we really just went for it. Uh, and I think that paid off. It was a big risk, but it worked.
Yeah, and I think you've alluded a couple of times to something which I think is really uh, interesting, which is that the fundamentals to the business. So, so you describe that customer experience, which is really cool, and and to have customers doing that obviously is really validating for what you do. But if the fundamentals of the business don't work in behind that, and if the margins aren't right, and if the that you, if it's not easy to distribute the product or it spoils too quickly or, you know, all of those things, if those things aren't right, then you still don't have a business, even if you're wowing customers, right? And, and so the, at the heart of this was you had great fundamentals. That may not have been obvious to somebody walking in off the street, but in behind, you had these great fundamentals. Absolutely. I mean, the first thing that matters above everything else is product and service, period. Uh, uh, you know, the rest is commentary, frankly. Um, but yeah, the economics of the business matter. I mean, it's not just about, it's not about getting rich quick or putting money in your own pocket. Uh, it's much more about having the resources to be able to scale, uh, and do a first class job. I mean, the more cash you're able to create free cash flow, um, the more effective you're able to be in carving out the strongest value proposition in the marketplace. All right. We are going to talk more about Mad Radish in a moment and about these two new brands that you've launched. And I'm really interested to hear how you're, how you're pivoting in this really unusual time. Um, I asked our mutual friend, Harley Finkelstein, uh, to give me a couple of questions to ask you. <laughs> and uh, Harley from Shopify, of course, um, who's been a guest on this podcast. And um, one of them that he asks is, you know, what, what did you go through having your name attached to this business as it was expanding? It's David's tea. It's got your name all over it. And then eventually stepping away from that. And, and you're not directly involved as much in the business anymore, but it's still got your name on it. What was that journey like? Well, great question, Harley. Shout out to you. Um, it, it was it, when we first, so the, the name, the way the name came about, uh, was we were with we had a marketing group at the time, which was a husband and wife couple uh, who had just moved back to Montreal. They lived in Sweden and they had a, uh, an ad agency in Sweden, a design firm, branding agency. And they had had some pretty high profile clients, Absolute Vodka, Marvel Comics. And they were looking, they didn't want to recreate the agency again. And they just wanted a fun project. And this was it. And so I was working out with them to try and create the name, the brand, the feel. Uh, and they came back and we explored a couple of names. We almost did uh, the letter T, like the T-stop in, in Boston. Um, we had, had one weird, wacky one, which was like Jules and Juliet, and it's sort of this play on two different characters. And I kept saying, nah, it doesn't feel right, doesn't feel right, doesn't feel right. And they finally kind of got frustrated. And they're like, well, why don't you just call it Dave's Tea? And I said, absolutely not. I don't want to be like Paul Newman with my name on the salad dressing. Uh, out of the question, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly not risk averse when it comes to business and I'm, I'm willing to, to uh, make bold moves, but I'm, 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 I, I don't think anybody would call me a loud person in my uh, private life. Um, so I was sort of not that into this. I mean, this is long before I'd ever done any kind of publicity or interview or anything like that. Um, but, but it kind of caught on. They were like, why? It's good. It's a good name. And you're a good spokesperson for it. And then my partner, uh, um, my cousin, he, he w came into work the next morning and he said, he said, no, don't call it Dave's tea. He says, everybody wants to have a beer with Dave. He said, call it David's tea. You want to have a tea with David. And so I always joke around. I used to be Dave before I was David. Um, and, and I'm David. And so it, we just sort of rolled with it and, and it, it stuck. And then they designed the logo. And then I remember the packaging came in and I called my parents. I'm like, I don't believe it. There's a hundred thousand bags right now with my name on it. Uh, what if this thing is a total flop? Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was, I, it took me a while to grow into the role is what I would say. Uh, I did not embrace it or enjoy it. It didn't come naturally to me. Um, but over time I learned to appreciate it and learn to, to, um, embrace it and, and respect it as both a privilege and a responsibility. And then when you were, were more disengaged from the business, what was that like? Very hard. Uh, I left David Steen in 2016 officially. Um, the company was a $400 million publicly traded company. Today it's a $30 million publicly traded company. Um, you know, there were, th oh, there was a lot of infighting 
um, between my original partner and his family and the private equity group he brought in, um, it was a very difficult situation. I, I just said enough at a certain point, enough for me. And I just, i decided I wanted to move on. I think when your board and your management team are spending their time fighting with each other rather than fighting the competition, uh, you got a big problem. Uh, you cannot expect to succeed with, by creating that kind of environment. And everybody needs to be willing to uh, make compromises and take hard looks in the mirror. And I don't think that was the case. Um, and, and so for a variety of reasons, I, 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 you know, with a heavy heart, had to leave the company uh, with my name on its door and, and, and something that I created from day one, day zero. Um, so yeah, no, that was very, very difficult. I tried to buy David's tea back a few times. I even went to Bain Capital, uh, and we sent my, my cousin a letter who was the majority shareholder, but, uh, he wasn't interested in selling. Uh, look, I have a lot of ideas on that business and things I would have liked to do, but uh, you know, it was, it was a difficult time for me in my life when, when I left and, and I had to reinvent myself and I had to apply my skills elsewhere and, and, out of that, I, I think I grew a lot as a person. Um, I, I actually think it's one of the best things that ever happened to me, although it was one of the most difficult. And why do you say that? What did you learn from it? How did it shape you going forward? When you're younger and you're trying to make it, um, everything is justified in the name of making it. So you're, you're, you're running around like a chicken without a head. You're, you're constantly, on, I mean, in those days, constantly on the airplane, um, you know, you're, you're sacrificing other things in your life, whether it's family or your own health or, or whatever the case may be in order to achieve this goal. And then you wake up more one morning and you've actually, if you're lucky enough that you've actually achieved it, I mean, and, and in my case, not only did I achieve it, but it was no longer, the company was now gone. I was out of the company, right? So I decided to leave. So you wake up one morning and, and you just, you, you have this, both this, uh, your identity in many ways is stripped from you and, and you're, you're, it's a huge opportunity to reinvent yourself. And it's very exciting on the one hand, but it's very scary on the other hand. And, and I think that it, it caused me to take a hard look in the mirror to say, who do I want to be? I mean, what is really truly important to me and, and how do I want to structure my life going forward? Because you're, you know, when you're younger and you're in these environments, you're trying to, you're trying to make it and prove, you're also trying to prove yourself. And so you have to get to a stage where, okay, well, I don't need to prove myself anymore. Uh, and, and with that is, is comes great freedom, but, but you have to, it also c comes with a great deal of uncertainty and fear. I mean, there's no longer any, uh, um, there's no, there's no longer this structure around you to, to guide you uh, as you go forward. Um, and so that, that whole journey in that process was, was, uh, was incredible. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah. And it happened to you at a very young age, right? I mean, we're, we're, you're mid thirties when, when all of this goes down and this new chapter I'm, of your life begins, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm 39 now. Uh, and this, I, 2016, I would have been, uh, 35 years old. Yeah. So yeah. what, what, uh, I mean, that's, that's a lot of runway ahead of you where you've got, uh, the benefits of financial security, but you've also got sort of this uncertainty and you're kind of untethered to anything. And so, you know, can you describe kind of the psychology of all of that and how you got through it and got on to the next thing? Well, I mean, I got through with fantastic support from my wife, um, my, my uh, parents, my, my friends, uh, Harley was actually a, a, a good support for me. And that was always, but in those times, especially, um, yeah, I mean, uh, lots of different, I mean, thankfully the people around me, uh, all of the people around me, um, made it, made it easier. Uh, you know, you, you, you realize that, that, that you're loved and that's a really nice feeling and, and that you're supported. I think that, that, you know, it's important in those moments to take your time. Uh, I'm not sure I took enough time as I reflect back on it, um, and you just, you just, I think you want to come at it with the curiosity of a child. I think you want to take your time and just poke around a lot and look at all the different opportunities coming, coming your way. You know, don't say no so fast. Don't say yes so fast either. You know, just say not now uh, over and over again and, and sort of let the pitches come through and see, 
explore different things, meet new people, look at different businesses, look at new angles. Um, and, and it really is an opportunity to do that. Uh, and you kind of have to resist what most entrepreneurs have, which is a, na a natural restlessness to sort of be doing and creating all the time. And I think there's value in, in, in just sitting with that emotion a little bit uh, and being able to give it a little bit of time before you jump back into something, uh, uh, something else. And for me, I eventually found that something else in Mad Radish and I, I jumped into it. Um, whether I jumped in it prematurely or not, I'm not sure, but it certainly has, has been uh, another amazing journey on, on its, on, in, its, in and of itself that continues to this day and is just starting to get very exciting for me. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I think that's really interesting because I think we, as entrepreneurs, there's a tendency to sort of define ourselves by what we're doing right now, right? And so when you're not doing something specific, when you're not building a company, it sort of feels weird to be able to, you know, to not be able to say to people, here's what I'm doing right now, right? Um, right. So it's, it's, uh, so let's talk about Mad Radish and, and how you arrived at that as the next big, uh, project into which you were going to invest your time and money? Well, so I was living in the US for, we did, with David's Tea, we built it to um, 70, I think 50 stores, about 70 million in revenue, something like that. Uh, and then we made a deal with a US private equity group, um, Highland Capital, uh, led up by, uh, they were out of Boston, and it was the founder from Staples, who was the lead partner, a uh, fellow by the name of Tom, Tom Stenberg, who unfortunately has since died. And um, I, I was the CEO at the time. I agreed to step down as CEO, uh, and we brought in a professional management team, a CEO who came from um, a head partner, retail partner, McKinsey, was the head buyer for Staples Group, Harvard MBA, all, all, all very uh, um, high pedigree American executives. Uh, and I worked with them. I first started by handling all the real estate, um, and then I eventually took over the buying group, which was... Uh, all the marketing, all the buying, um, a team of 40 people. Uh, and, and that's what I did until we went public. Um, and, and so we, I moved down to Boston because we, had done, we were working with this U.S. group. So I, we lived in Boston for two years. And during that time, I mean, as a guy who was always on the go, I was blown away by how many amazing fast food options there were. Um, and moving back to Canada then afterwards, we decided to move back to Ottawa, which is where I'm from, uh, and, and raise our children here. There really, it, it, there were a lot of food deserts. It just, it, the, the, the U.S. is about 10 years ahead of us when it comes to fast food. And so finally, I, I just said, you know what, I'm going to do something about it. I looked at potentially bringing some of these uh, concepts that I liked in the U.S. up into Canada, but... Um, they all said, no, I mean, Canada, it's like asking for the rights to the Ukraine. They're so busy. It, we're such a small population. They're so busy growing, you know, across a population of 350 million people that just not even on the radar. Um, so I, I, uh, I finally started creating Mad Radish. So Mad Radish was about food that would be uh, both make you feel good and have an element of nutrition, but also taste great and not leave you hungry. Uh, be filling enough that you're not, you know, hungry again in two hours like you are when you eat a bowl of spinach. So, uh, and and it's really evolved into be all about hearty bowls, you know, roasted vegetables, fresh proteins uh, made every morning, um, and and what we call our green bowls, which are sort of lighter salads, but still with with still filling with with a lot of uh, um, amazing proteins, special marinades on our chicken, etc. And, and then the business has really evolved, though, from there. And, and we've kind of extended our value proposition and our mission. And we've realized that what we're trying to do in Canada is we want to be the market leader in gourmet fast food. Uh, that's what we're all about. And now what is gourmet fast food? Well, gourmet fast food is food that is uh, made quickly, but doesn't compromise on quality, on big flavors. Um, it's got to be incredible food and you don't, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can still have food made quickly and have it be, uh, um, incredibly tasty. And so that's what Mad Radish is all about. And so during the pandemic, we got to work on creating two new brands that would operate out of the Mad Radish stores, uh, that would be part of this gourmet fast foods family. So we created Louisa's burritos and bowls, which is authentic South American ingredients, you know, made in every morning, our guacamole fresh. Uh, again, an incredible proprietary uh, spice rub for our chicken. 
uh, which is also made fresh. And, and then we also created Revival Pizza, which is uh, Neapolitan style pizza, but with a modern twist. Very simple, high quality ingredients. Our sauce is three ingredients. It's just San Marzano tomatoes, fresh oregano, sea salt, that's it. Uh, the dough is airy and fluffy, but still firm enough on the bottom that it holds up during delivery. Um, you know, if we do our mushroom pizza, for example, is all specialty mushrooms. We don't use any of the basics ones. We even use this one called the maitake mushroom, which is called Hen of the Woods here in Canada. So we named the product Hen of the Woods. Um, so we've created these two brands and all three brands, Mad Radish, Louisa's and Revival are all made to order, but they're built to travel. So we had delivery in mind when we created them. And the way it's going to work is they operate out of the same space. So you'll walk into a Mad Radish. We're about to open one in Barhaven. Uh, we'll be doing Canada, hopefully later in 2021 as well. And of course, we have our three stores in Ottawa and three in Toronto, and we'll be expanding in Toronto as well. But you walk into a Mad Radish, the sign on the door is going to say Mad Radish Gourmet Fast Foods. You walk in, there's three menus available, uh, the Mad Radish menu, the Louise's menu, and the Revival Pizza menu. And you can order from any one of the menus. And if you're with multiple people, they can each order from different menus. We'll have our Mad Radish app, which has all three brands available that you can order for pickup. And we'll soon be adding delivery to our own app as well. And again, if you have three people, one of you can get a Mad Radish bowl, one can get a Louise's burrito, one can get a Revival pizza. And then each one of the brands will also be available on the Uber Eats platform um, for delivery uh, with their own quote unquote storefront on Uber Eats. So how did you make decisions about all of that? And how did you sort of zero in on those product areas? Uh, what was, what was the process like for that? Well, I think, I think we just, I always like to go back to a question when I'm developing product or, or, or a business for that matter is why does the world need this? So, you know, you, you want to be carving out uh, a, a market position that where there's a void. And I really believe in Canada, we have a, a void of gourmet fast foods. Uh, and I think there's a market for it. I think people want food that, that is of a higher quality, um, but they still can't afford to wait. And I think Garner, the, you know, delivery is going to be a bigger part of the food business. Um, it was becoming a bigger part of the food business prior to the pandemic and the pandemic accelerated that. And, and I, I don't think that you can create um, food that was meant to be eaten at a sit down restaurant and just stick it in a box and put it in a car or on a bike for 30 minutes and expect it to be uh, delicious. Um, you have to approach the business with uh, delivery and takeout in mind. And that's what we've done with Mad Radish. Uh, whether that's choosing greens that don't wilt as easily or creating a pizza crust that, that might hold up a little better. Um, those are important factors. And so I think, I think that that's where we want to be specialists. We want to be all about these, the notion of gourmet fast foods and whether that applies to pizza or burritos or bowls in the case of Mad Radish, um, we feel we can share that common food philosophy across all of our brands, even though they each have their own unique flavors and their own unique look and feel. How is technology changing the food business? Uh, are, are there, are, are you seeing that happen? And, and when you, you know, when I look at things like Uber Eats, skip the dishes, that sort of thing, do you see that as a solution for the food industry, a complement to it, or, or perhaps even a threat in some cases? The future is multi-channel, that's for sure. We don't know what will happen after the pandemic, but we're prepared for all possibilities, whether that's going to primarily in-house uh, eating or takeout uh, um, or contactless pickup on the app or delivery through the third-party platforms or through our own delivery. I think we have to have multiple ways and options for our customers to be able to e easily order with us. Um, but I'll tell you what's not changing is that the food business is about great food. It's about strong value propositions. It's, it's great food at a great price. And, and, and uh, that, that's timeless. I, I mean, I don't see that getting disrupted. Uh, you still got to put the food in your mouth and eat it. So, so I mean, I think that's really, uh, um, you know, same with service. I mean, service is, 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 is timeless. I mean, great service has been around forever. Uh, and I think it will be around into the future. So I, I just think it's important not to lose. It's great to think about what is changing and embrace that and, and make sure you're prepared for that. But it's also really important to look at what isn't changing because those are some of the end up being some of the pillars of your business. Uh, uh, 
you know, having fast, easy and effective distribution is, is incredible. And that's what technology has enabled. They've also enabled you to be, it's also uh, about embracing um, being able to tailor your messaging to each individual customer better than you were in the past through the data that you're getting through all these different uh, digital platforms and ways of ordering. Um, that's, that's certainly a, a benefit to everybody. Everybody, you know, gets, they get marketed to and things that they actually want uh, or need versus, versus uh, blanket marketing to everybody the exact same way. So there, there are ways in which uh, technology is, is, is I, I see it all as a major benefit to the business and we're embracing it all. Um, but without losing focus on what's the pillar of the business, the pillar of the business is at Mad Ratch, it's gourmet fast foods. The food's got to be made quickly and taste fantastic. And that's really what, and have, and be of a higher quality. And that's, that's, that's a, something that, that shouldn't change. You mentioned earlier the future, you predicted the future will be more similar to the past than a lot of people think it will. I tend to agree with you on that, that uh, I think we're going to go back to a lot of the things we did before um, and and that a lot of people are extrapolating what we're experiencing during the pandemic and assuming it's a long-term trend, but I think people are going to want to go out again. They're going to want to get together again. They're going to want to be... Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 all of... We love to hype up the new and the unknown. Uh, and it doesn't mean that, that it's not all here to stay. I'm sure it is. I mean, I have no doubt that video calls are going to continue to become a bigger part of our lives. And I have no doubt that, that delivery uh, will continue to be a bigger part. And digital ordering will continue to be a bigger part of the restaurant business. And we're preparing for that. And, and, uh, but the notion that we're going to completely, we always view these things as an either or when in re reality, they're an and. It's not 100% or 0%. It's, 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 they're all important to living. And, and I think that you're not going to replace, nothing is going to replace in-person human contact. I, I, I think that's central to our species. And I just, I don't see that fundamentally going away. And uh, it will change and evolve. And, and uh, we need to be prepared for, for all of those potential evolutions. But, but it's, not, it's not about throwing out the old and just completely embracing the new. I think it's about, about being prepared for, uh, for whatever the outcomes may be. Was it difficult to market uh, healthy food to customers? Is there, is there a challenge around that that's unique to what you were doing with Mad Radish? Yes, uh, uh, this is the short answer. Uh, the longer answer is absolutely it, 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 um, people have different interpretations of what healthy means. I think that where we landed with this is that mad radish is, we want you to feel good after you eat our food. Sometimes when you eat fast food, you feel very heavy and you don't feel great. Uh, um, and we want to make sure you feel really, we want you to feel full. We don't want you to be hungry but we want you to feel good. And I think that's, that's how, I mean, Mad Radish also, we, we, we have a nutritionist. We want to make sure that the food is, is packed full of, of uh, nutrition and vegetables. Uh, um, all of our dishes have an element of that. But it, it's important that the food leaves you feeling good. I think that where we landed was that, that is the most important criteria. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's kind of how we have approached it. You talked earlier about business purgatory, and I've heard you speak about this before. Can you, can you describe what that is and, and how you end up there and how you get out of it? So, I, I mean, there's, there's success, which runaway success is always easy. Yay, it's, it's successful and, and everybody's happy. And of course, failure is actually not as hard as people think. When you have an honest failure and it just bombs and it doesn't work, it's actually easy to be like, well, I gave it my all, it didn't work. The hard part in business is the in-between. It's, it's, it's the purgatory. It's, it's sort of working. You're maybe in the black, but just barely. You're scraping by and you're trying to figure it out. Um, and I think, I think that usually it's one of three things. It's either product. Uh, the product needs to evolve. It's not quite there. You don't have the product market fit. Uh, um, people. You just don't have the right people on your, on your team who can help you accelerate this thing or who, who, who really understand what you're trying to do or it's your ego and you're getting in your own way. Um, and so I think when you're in purgatory, which most businesses end up in, in some way, shape or form, it's important to keep those three 
I find it, it valuable to keep, all right, well, where's my ego at and how is it impacting this? And how about the people around me? And, and then what about the product? And I find focusing on one, on those three things t- it tends to help get out of purgatory and, and, and create a better business model and, and, and a stronger team uh, and, and, a, and a better and turn your, and improve yourself in terms of your management capabilities and, and, and uh, uh, acumen. Yeah, the way you described it, I, I think, is really insightful because I think you can you can end up there. You can start off successful, and then end up in a stage of purgatory, right? You can hit a plateau, sure. and then absolutely and then move out of it, and then you can perhaps end up in another one, right? If you're in business long enough, you you ultimately uh, might end up in purgatory more than once. Yeah, I mean, uh, Apple was in purgatory for a very long time. Sure, I mean, they were almost done at one point, and look what happened there. So, yeah. You empower your employees to act like founders. I've heard you talk about this before. Can you describe how you do that? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in giving uh, key employees some ownership in the business, uh, for starters. Um, and I think you have to be willing to let people make mistakes. You have to weigh, you have to weigh when you're deciding, and a lot of founders or owners have this issue where they're, they're, uh, two hands on and they have a hard time letting go. And I think you have to just, you're never going to be able to, to scale if you can't trust people. And I think you have to ask yourself, what is the, the impact on the business of this decision? And if the answer is it's not a major impact on the, on the business, meaning that every decision, most decisions are impactful one way or the other, but, but meaning that it's not hard to reverse it. And if the person's wrong, it's not the end of the world. Um, I think you got to let people make mistakes and you got to let them take accountability and for their decisions and, and try things and, and learn from them. And, uh, you got to give people room for, to spread their wings and fly. And, and if you, I think that's really important, I think, I think you have to make the business as much about them as it is about you. Uh, and, and I think that's a trap that a lot of people who have a hard time scaling fall into. How do you operationalize that at the, at the ground level though? Like how do you, you know, with, with the, the people who are on the front lines of your business? Great question. I think that, that the leeway is different, obviously for your, you know, right hand person, uh, executive versus for the person making the food in the store, but even the person making the food in the store, you want to empower them. I mean, we've had in both of, of David Stee and Mad Radish, uh, I'm a big believer in, in having an empowerment policy where, you know, make it right with the customer, period. I don't need you to ask permission to hand customers a free salad or, or, to, or to give someone a brownie because you made them wait longer than they should have or make it right on the spot with the customer, end of story. Um, and so, you know, with very few exceptions, that's how we, we try and, and, and live by that. And we try and give our employees in the store the flexibility, our team members, to be able to do that. And we want them. I think that there's a lot of, of um, value and certainly f- fulfillment purpose in being able to make someone's day. I think it's very underrated. Uh, and I think maybe we're starting to appreciate it more now that we all have to wear masks indoors. But when someone smiles at you and says, you know, when you're not having a great day, even though you don't know them, it's, it can be warming. It can be, it can be a nice feeling. Uh, and I think that when you work in, in hospitality or retail, you have that opportunity. And so we try and impart that on, on our store teams and say, Hey, you know, you can derive a lot of purpose by making someone stay here and, and, and don't hesitate to do that. We're going to give you the tools and, and the, and the support in order to be able to do that. Yeah, I really like that because a lot of people talk about empowering uh, the team to make it right from the perspective of that being better service for the customer, but it's also better for the employee, right? And it, it, it absolutely, yeah, that's a that's a powerful lesson. You talked about uh, in the past not fully understanding your emotions and letting them govern you. Sometimes, um, how have you? learn to overcome that. Uh, that's a challenge everybody faces, obviously, and nobody's ever perfect at it. But, but do you have any particular tools or practices to overcome that? Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's an ongoing challenge, and I'm, I suspect it will be for my entire life, as it is for everybody, like you alluded, you mentioned. Um, I, I find, I mean, I love exercise. I exercise a lot. Uh, I, I do a fair amount of, of mindfulness uh, and, and meditation. I've been doing it now for, for years. Um, it's one of these things that you do not see benefit from if you do it casually uh, or, or without any kind of, you need to do it consistently and you need to do it for an extended period of time. 
but over time, I've gotten a lot of benefit of that. I, I find I'm a little bit less reactive uh, overall. Um, yeah, I mean, those, those are really important. It's, it's, it's important to be able to, uh, it's important to be able to step back from things and, and not be impulsive and, and answer right away in order to be able to calm down, think about it. Uh, you know, where you make your worst decisions is when you have emotional strain or you're worked up or you're too quick on the punch. Uh, at least that's what it's, I've, it's been for me. All right. Last question. Is it true that you have a secret door from your kitchen to your home office? <laughs> Who told you about the secret? I, this is, this is nice. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It's kind of neat actually. It's like it, it blends into the wall. So it, it, it's, it's my, it's my Batman cave. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, because I, I saw a magazine article about your beautiful kitchen and, and, I, and I guess there's just a little trick door that you can slide. I mean, it's not such a trick. The, it just yeah. opens and closes, but it, it blends in. It, you wouldn't, yeah. If you just glance at it, you think it's part of the millwork rather than a door in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> David, this has been fascinating. I, I've really learned a lot from this conversation and I, I really wish you the best moving forward with not just Mad Radish now, but these three brands. It's going to be really exciting to see how that grows and develops, especially as we emerge from this pandemic. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me, Mark. Really enjoyed it. I really like that concept of business purgatory that David talked about. I also enjoyed his insights about empowering employees and how you can't grow without good people and having the curiosity of a child. And I really loved hearing the whole story of the branding of David's tea and how people want to have a beer with Dave, but a tea with David. So once again, thank you to David for joining us on Digging Deep. If you enjoyed this episode, please review it and share it with others. That will help us produce more great episodes. And if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, see the show notes, subscribe to our weekly newsletter, or read my blog, just go to letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. Thank you for listening.